Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Wednesday of the month. Is it the second or the third? Third. So oh, my God. See, I don't even know. You know, I, I just got done with a 10-day bundle, which you had a wonderful product in, by the way. So for 10 days, we didn't sleep. We didn't eat. We didn't shower. I don't even know what day it is. But it is the third Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for Dr. Ether's Ether. I can't even speak today. I need sleep. Help me, someone. Dr. Ether's prescription for health. And today, he is going to give you his prescription for healthy bones. Please welcome Dr. Esser. How are you today? I am great. I think uh, I'll just take it from here and you can go take a nap. So, uh, <laughs> you're, well, you know, you're a lifestyle medicine doc. You know, sleep isn't one of the pillars. It is crucial. Can you give me access to share screen and we'll get cooking? I sure will. Here you go. All right. All right. So, I'll uh, jump right in here. Oh, hold on. Let me go back to that. So, all right. There we go. And there it is. All right. Wonderful. Can everybody see that okay? You got it, Chef AJ. You can see Perfect. the slides. Yep. Wonderful. All right. Good. So today, I think we're going to talk about a very important topic. And, and I, I want to tell everybody, this is not the end of the conversation. This should be kind of a stepping stone for you if you're curious about your bones and want to keep them healthy, which we're going to talk about why that's just so important. So we may not have all the answers today, but we're going to be hopefully giving some good data, some good information to get you going. I'm going to take you to mini medical school. We're going to talk about the anatomy of your bones, uh, how they work, some few statistics. We're going to talk about the risk of your bones not doing well, and ideally come up with a little bit of an approach to how you can begin to prevent slow progression, improve the health of your bones over time. So let's get into our mini medical school first. Uh, the basics, right? If you're on uh, Jeopardy, right? 206 bones, although some people have more or less based on if they have some ossicles, some little sort of unique bones. Uh, but what is the purpose of these bones, right? They support our soft tissues, right? The skin, blah, 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 right? My muscles, et cetera. They maintain the shape of the human form, right? Giving us our unique shape that most humans have. Uh, facilitate our movement, right? It is our bones connected by muscles, tendons, and ligaments that allow us to move uh, like these different amazing structures that we are. Uh, the bones, of course, protect our vital organs, that rib cage protecting our lungs, our hearts, right? These crucial you know, organs inside. And the bones, interestingly enough, are not just sitting there hard. They actually are alive. And inside of your bones, you produce a lot of the different blood cells, right? The red blood cells, white blood cells, the platelets, the stem cells, et cetera. They're actually residing in and being produced within your bone marrow, that inner spongy component of the bones. Uh, when you are young and uh, delightfully so, your bones are all red marrow, meaning they're very active, full of all these red cells. And as you age, a big portion of the bones turn more into yellow marrow, which ends up being, being fat storage. But interestingly enough, and anecdotally, I will tell you, the people who consume an excellent nutritional program seem to maintain uh, their red marrow longer, the function and activation and activity uh, of those bones. And the bones also play an important part in storing your calcium, iron, as well as in hormone balance and influencing uh, the production of and the use of various hormones. This is a nice slide showing us that layout. We've got this compact cortical bone, it's called, which are the outer layers of the pipe, right? And then we've got this spongy bone or this bone marrow uh, kind of all through the inner component. I like to think of the inside of the bone kind of like a sponge, like that might be on your kitchen counter. Uh, and so when you think about it that way, you're like, yeah, things can happen to that sponge, right? Either it can dry out and break down, we can get little tears and injuries to it. And what you use, what type of cleaners, how frequently you use it, all that can influence that sponge health. And that's the same thing for our bones as we're going to learn that there are a lot of factors that improve your bone health. It's not like, oh, born with certain bones and there you go. It's like, no, they're actually modifiable uh, throughout our lifespan. And the little buggers, the little cells that are heavily involved in this process uh, at the basic level are osteoclasts and osteoblasts. That'll be on the quiz later. So the osteoblasts are the bone building cells and the osteoclasts are the remodelers, the ones that break it down. And I put this slide up from a scientific article just to show you how our present knowledge of these cells is that they have all these receptors all over them. 
And so what you and I do, the toxins we're exposed to, the sleep we get, the nutrients we absorb, so on and so forth, can influence the activation of these cells. In fact, even exercise, as you and I do weight-bearing activities, there is a stimulating effect on osteoblasts. And so these osteoblasts build our bone denser and harder in response to that input. So this is why it's so valuable for you to be thinking about in your head, what are the different choices I'm making with regards to my health and how do they influence at the cellular level my bone integrity, my bone health? Because our bones start out, in fact, as cartilage, this very soft, rubbery substance that you can feel kind of in your nose, right, kind of thing. And that's why if you've ever had a baby in your arms, you've got to twist it and turn it every which way, bring its feet up to its head, et cetera, because it's all just cartilaginous. And in fact, we don't fully ossify, become bony fully, until we're in our teenage years. And so in those late teenage years, boys, usually around 16, girls around 18, we're now fully ossified. All of the cartilage that was the bone is now os osteoblastic formation. So it's very hard, you know, et cetera. And that's why uh, then little babies and little children, right, can often get a green stick fracture. It's called a little bending fracture of their arms or legs versus for us as we get older, it just cracks like more of a dry stick if you're going to get a fracture. But the bones themselves have this rapid growth phase. And then there is a plateauing, and then there is a progressive loss. In women in particular, more of a rapid loss around the time of menopause, of course, as the estrogen decreases, because estrogen is bone building, right? It is a hormone that increases bone formation. So as that estrogen level declines, so does the bone health. So we see these three phases, this attainment of peak bone mass, this consolidation around the ages of 25 to 45 or so, and then this age-related and hormonal-related bone loss. Because of the influences of testosterone, because of the influences of heavy lifting, on average, men do more heavy lifting, mechanical stimulated, right, sort of backbreaking, if you will, work than women on average in our society. This combination of multiple factors causes men to have a higher bone mass at peak on average than most women. And as a result of the fact that estrogen is not as much of an influencer, they also lose less of that bone mass as compared to women who enter into menopause. And then we see that rapid drop off for several years around that time, right? Right around that is late 40s to early 50s. And that takes us all too often close to that fracture threshold. That point at which the bone has lost enough of its integrity, enough of its density, that now it's easier to crack. I'm sitting out here outside. I, I can turn my camera. You can see there's the beautiful outdoors. I'm on a back porch of one of our little bungalows here at the ranch. And I'm looking at some trees and it's making me think, yes, you know, this attainment of peak bone mass and this consolidation, these are all the phases of when that tree branch is nice and green. If you've ever taken a tree branch that's green and has sap and it's healthy, you try to bend it and break it. It doesn't break readily. But when you get that dried out branch, it easily goes. And that's what we want to avoid for our bones as we age. Some unique things that are fun to think about now that we're in medical school together is that when you're a youth, you have open growth plates. Those are the little places in the bone that are growing most rapidly, right? That's where we're growing from. So there's rapid elongation and a significant, as I mentioned, this osteo, uh, this hardening of the bone, right? This increased density that occurs. The stabilization is all during early adulthood. Now I'm bringing this back up again for a couple of reasons. One is I want you to understand it. Number two, I want you to be thinking in your head, Oh, how can I intercept? Where are those opportunities? So you may not be 12 anymore, if you are, and you're watching this because you like to learn. But the reality is you probably know someone who's 12 or 14 or eight or have some right social circles of people like that, nephews, nieces, children, et cetera, grandchildren. And so you want to be thinking, well, how can I help them? Because let's go back a slide or two to here. How can I help them to attain the highest peak bone mass possible as they age? right? Because we want to all get as high as we can before we start that decline. And this is the same with muscle building as well, as it turns out. So the physiologic effects of aging for us on our skeletal health is that on average, we lose about 1% in bone mass per year after 35. And as I mentioned, during that postmenopausal phase, um, 2 to 3%. 
So we don't want that. And we're going to talk about that. Now, a lot of other things happen with aging too, don't they? Our cardiovascular output decreases, our respiratory function decreases, our muscle mass decreases, nerves slow. This is all part of senescence, this, uh, this senility that progresses. And don't let anybody in the healthy movements you know, fool you. You and I are not meant to be here forever. We will not last forever. But our goal should be to have the highest quality of function and performance possible. We're not looking for immortality on this earth, but we are looking for high quality of function and performance, right? And so that's why it's so crucial that there are age-related changes that occur. And we've got to work even harder on some of these areas as we age to prevent the progressive decline and the loss of function and fun. Now, as you think about, uh, you know, sort of bone density, in our society today, of course, we commonly talk about T-scores. And this is a simple standard deviation sort of density test uh, in which they compare your present uh, density to a young reference normal. And so let's look at a couple of slides. They, they use a DEXA scanner, right? Which gives a low amount of radiation and is checking the density of your bones. So they get some sort of, a, sort of chart like this after doing a DEXA scan. And that this is looking at the low back, looking at the lumbar vertebrae, and looking at the density of each of those bones. And so we can see osteopenia uh, would be in the yellow osteoporosis, the red and green, a healthy range. And so we have the T-score, which compares your bone density to some to folks in their 20s to 30s. And then we have a Z-score that compares your bone density to people of a similar age to yourself, right? And uh, so it's interesting to kind of look at that across the board. This is another slide showing us that we can see to the far left of the screen, that would be osteoporosis minus 2.5 or below, and then osteopenia, and then the green being healthy range. So osteopenia, you should think of as saying, oh, we're losing a little bit of the uh, sort of density of the sponge, and then osteoporosis, we're losing a lot. So this is a nice sort of image on electro microscope, and we see the normal bone sort of the density of the marrow. Uh, and then we see a bone with osteoporosis where we've lost a lot of those little interconnecting fibers of the sponge. Now, the problem with getting to this phase where we've got a hollow stick that can easily be broken uh, is that it really affects a lot of people negatively, right? I mean, so you break that femur, the thigh bone, uh, your risk of actually dying in the next five years is up to 50%. It's pretty high, it's the double or triples. Um, you know, you go to pick up the heavy planter or the table, and you get a compression fracture in your back, and it can squirt the bone backwards and compress your spinal cord, um, or you can just end up being larched forward the rest of your life, um, or just have chronic pain in the back, none of which we want. And so we want to be really conscientious, uh, you know, that this is real, and that loss of bone density has a lot of negative effects, long-term on function, performance, pain, et cetera. So now let's move into what are the risk factors for osteoporosis, this thinning of the bones. Well, the things out of your control are, of course, age, your gender, your ethnicity, prior history of fracture, family history, and then your hormonal balance. Although some things obviously can be done to influence hormones. In your control, there's a whole host of things. And that's why I put hormonal balance there as well. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about several of these. Let's start with age. This is such a worthwhile topic because individuals over the age of 65, the number in America are rapidly increasing. If you look here, you'll notice in 1900, there were only 3 million individuals in America over the age of 65. Uh, there are now 56 million. That's 18% of the population. And in fact, the fastest growing proportion or group in the entire US are those over the age of 85, right? So there is a rapid increase uh, in individuals over the age of 65 and, as I mentioned, over the 85. So this is very important for those of you who are over that age. Uh, but also, I would say this is a crucial topic for those of you who are 20. Because as I mentioned, the goal here is not to wait until you have less than ideal bone density and then go, oh, what do I do now? But rather, it's about what can I do today to keep my bones healthy long term? So I hope a lot of you out there in your 20s, 30s, 40s who are listening to this because the things in your control are the things that I want you to be addressing. Let's start with smoking. Right now, fewer than 12% of Americans smoke. Of course, that's 12% too many. Uh, but nicotine has a lot of vasoconstrictive effects, meaning it decreases blood flow. 
When you decrease blood flow to the bones, you impair osteoblasts receiving perfusion. So they don't get the nutrition they need and they're unable to do the work that they need to do. Uh, and then there are also all kinds of other chemicals in, nicot in the cigarettes themselves that have negative effects on bone health. Alcohol, yep, nobody likes to hear it, but alcohol impairs bone mineral density. This is where it's so fascinating to me because some, some people say, Dr. Esser, you're so like strict about all these different things. I go, no, I'm not strict. I just want you to know the science. I want you to understand that what you do actually matters. And so if you say to me, I have a family history of osteoporosis, my mother, my aunts, my grandmother, et cetera. I don't want that. Well, if you don't want that, and that is one of your true health goals going through life, well, then you've got to stop drinking alcohol because alcohol increases your risk, right? So more than one a day in women, more than two a day in men in particular has very negative effects on bone growth, on that osteoblast formation and function. Remember we said osteoblasts build bone, osteoclasts cut it or break it down. That's how you can memorize this. Of course, alcohol inhibits vitamin D, right? And how it works and functions. And I mean, it's pretty crazy when you think about it, but right now the federal government per says that 26% of Americans binge drink, uh, you know, kind of any given month. And that's more than four or five, six drinks at a time. Uh, you know, kind of, that's a problem. And all of that has very powerful negative effects on your bones. So go to your cabinets, dump out the alcohol, get some sparkling ciders if you want something nice, cool to chill and to drink. Make some fresh, you know, squeeze juices and so on and so forth. But don't fill your body with stuff that compromises your bones. Next are medications. Turns out many medicines, including very common medicines like diabetic medications or diuretics like Lasix or even things like some of the mental health drugs like Prozac and Zoloft, all of these actually impair bone health. And so for those individuals out there, for example, have chronic reflux, uh, this is those are absolutely toxic when it comes to your bones because they impair vitamin D, they impair calcium absorption and function. Uh, there's a lot of negative effects of these medications. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to not need these medicines, to not need these medicines, right? And sometimes you might need them, but we don't want to be using them on a daily basis if we don't have to. And we want to have maximized the lifestyle, the supplements, these sort of things before we go to them, uh, et cetera. Next, we've got comorbidities. These diseases increase your risk on average of osteoporosis, of poor bone density. Uh, it makes total sense, things like digestive disorders, like celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease, because you're not absorbing the different vitamin K and the vitamin D and the calcium and all the different molecules you require to form good bones in your body. Uh, different things like autoimmune disease with chronic inflammation appears to impair osteoblast function and bone formation. So a lot of stuff going on there, right? Thyroid dysfunction, right? Low thyroid and high thyroid, both can lead to bone abnormalities. So I put these up there because it's important to know what you're dealing with, what diseases you have or have had or are at risk for. And if, you know, some people out there may not want to be seeing doctors and getting worked up and things like that, I think it's valuable to get a good diagnosis, to know what you're dealing with, right? So if you notice you're having hair loss and puffy skin and decreased energy and impaired sleep habits, you should really get your thyroid checked, right? You should really get all the basic hormones checked in your body so you know what's going on. I remember I had a good example of this so some time back is I had a patient who just had all kinds of weird things. Just It wasn't making sense. Their weight issues, their energy issues. They were developing some man breasts. It was a male. I mean, all these different things. And four or five different doctors totally just like, oh, whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're eating too much or this, that, and the other. When I saw them, I was like, something's not right. And I ordered this whole broad panel of all their hormones. And my goodness, things were all over the place. Then we got an MRI of the brain and it turned out they had a tumor in the pituitary. And that pituitary tumor was leading to all these hormonal abnormalities, which were then leading to all these abnormal findings in their bones, which had then led to their fractures, which is why I had seen them to begin with. And so really important that you get the right diagnoses to understand what's going on in your body. But it turns out if you do have any of these diseases, they increase your risk of poor bone density. Another one that is so universal, right? So important to understand is that if you have heart disease, right? If you have coronary artery disease, 
uh, that is a marker as a risk factor for osteoporosis, right? So on this slide, you can appreciate this is the spine. These are bone, disc, bone, disc. And this thing all through here is actually your aorta, the largest blood vessel in your body. And on an x-ray, which is what this is, you should not see that blood vessel. The fact you can see it tells you that it is coated with cholesterol and calcium. So this is atherosclerosis and hardening. Now it makes total sense that if this thing is all getting clogged up on the edges and periphery, the tiny blood vessels that feed the spine are unable to do their job. And that in turn leads to low bone density and fragility fractures. Here's another couple studies for you to look at later. You can pause the video and look at these yourself. But it turns out that if you get an x-ray of your low back and it shows that you got abdominal aortic calcifications, which is that heart disease you can see on an x-ray, uh, that it by itself is a risk factor for you developing fractures in your back or in your hips, etc. And so your bone mineral density appears to be inversely associated right with the presence of these aortic calcifications. So if a person has high amounts of heart disease, they tend to have lower bone mineral density. Very interesting stuff. And why does it make sense? Well, look at that little picture that's on this slide. That is a picture of bones with the blood vessels into it. So remember how I said your bones are these factories of blood cells? Well, if they're factories, they need lots of ins and outs for blood to get in and out to carry these blood cells that are produced. And so they're incredibly well perfused. That's why if you break a bone, it bleeds like stink. And so that's what we're seeing right there. So if you are blocking up the big arteries, like your coronary arteries, right? Or that abdominal aorta, you better believe the tiny little vessels that go into your bones, they're all closed down. They're all closed off. And we'll do a whole talk on that soon, Chef AJ, on kind of the interrelationship of perfusion and musculoskeletal health, where we talk about kind of tendons and ligaments and how they need perfusion too. The next risk factor is weight. And this is an important one because our society prioritizes, number one, aesthetically, a low weight. Number two, we know that a lower weight is, turns out to be healthier on average for your joints, right? For the weight that you're bearing through there, as well as to be a predictive risk factor for all the common lifestyle diseases. So all that excess visceral fat or belly fat that we're carrying, right? Increases adipokine production, increases your risk of heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. But there is also a, J, a curve here. You go too far on that low bone mineral, or pardon me, BMI scale, that weight scale. We now run the risk of not having enough pressure on the bones to build them. So our young dancers who are hyper aware of their weight constantly, the woman who obsesses about her weight constantly, or the extremely strict low calorie density consumer, which we're very big advocates of. Well, the problem is if that BMI is creeping down into the 17s, 16s, things like that, we're starting to get into a place that is not healthy for the bones. And so two parts there, right? We want that fine balance. We want enough of the superficial or stored fats, et cetera, on the body. So we have a little bit of fat reserves for if you get sick or ill, right? So that your body has some energy to jump into, but also a small, we want some estrogen production. We don't want uh, this estrogen production, this small amount that comes from a small amount of fat to be completely annihilated because the estrogen has some anabolic effects. So if your BMI is creeping down below that 18 range, I think it's important to kind of look at your caloric intake and your energy expenditures and then look at your absorption and all these other things. So uh, important stuff, but excessively low BMIs is not what we're looking for either. Next risk factor is exercise. Movement of the body resulting in enhancement of health, right? And of course, multiple different uh, uh, types of exercise. And we're going to talk about each of these a little bit. You'll notice here on this slide, this is cutting through a bone. It's the radius, the arm bone. And you can see a 50-year-old, a 60-year-old. And you see how that cortical outer layer is thinning uh, as well as kind of that inner layer. I have very intimate sort of experiences with people's bones because I often do bone marrow harvests for my stem cell procedures. And what I do is I am taking a large trocar, a very big, thick needle and sticking it into people's hips. And it's fascinating for me because some people, it's like, I'm putting that thing in. It's like, oh, oh I can't get in, can't get in. Oh, finally it pops in. And then other people, it's like tissue paper. It's just shook. And I go, wow, you know, you've got really thin bones. Tell me more. Uh, about your most recent bone density scan when we make a plan from there. As it turns out, exercise has powerful effects on preventing or reversing bone loss. You can see about 1% per year. Remember how we said 
that past the age of 35, on average, there is a 1% per year loss. So that's why it's so crucial that we're getting that weight bearing resistance training intensity exercise that is putting demand through the bones, through the tendons, through the antheses. An anthesis is an insertion site of a tendon into a bone. So like where my biceps inserts right here, that would be an anthesis. And I need to be really putting big force through there to build the bones, right? As it turns out, the more prolonged the exposure, the more progressive the benefits. So in this 2016 study I'm quoting you, they did a 16-year follow-up. And for each year that the individuals who were in the study continued with the exercise, they had continued gains and improvements. So your viewers out there, I don't want you to say, oh, I did eight weeks and or I did six months and it was only a tiny bit better. And so, oh, well, I'm going to stop the exercise. No, no, that's not it. You need to continue it progressively over time. Because not only, of course, does the exercise improve bone density, it's going to improve your functional mobility, reduce your fall risk, and improve your quality of life. And so we need to keep that exercise going. But keep this in mind. The majority of the studies say the following. You need to actually push those bones and muscles hard to get true benefit. There are some studies saying that specific yoga poses may help a little bit, things of this nature. And yes, a little bit is better than none. But if you're serious about creating truly healthy bones long-term, you need to be serious about the force you're putting through the bones. Now, with that as the caveat, do not violate the twos. Going too far, too fast, too soon. So on here I wrote, and in these studies this is what they demonstrate. Ideal would be 80 to 90% of your one rep max for maximum benefit. What does that mean? Let's say that on a seated leg press machine, you could do 100 pounds. That's the most you could do one time and you'd be like, I'm done, I can't do anymore. One rep max, it's called. That's absolutely the most you could push. Well, then you would need to do 80 or 90 pounds for approximately 15 to 20 repetitions in order to get the true bone building benefits. Now, that doesn't mean you go to the gym and start doing 80 or 90 pounds if that's, you know, if your one rep max is 100. It means you go to the gym and you start with 20 pounds and then you build a 30 and then you build a 35 and you build a 40 and then 45, right? And so over the next six to eight weeks, you progressively increase with a goal of getting to that 80 to 90% of your one rep max. And you do that for the, all the major muscle groups. So there should be at least five upper body and five lower body exercises that you do. This can be done very quickly. It's not some long thing where you're spending three hours in the gym. It can be very quick, but it has to be done with initial progression, right? So daily, kind of weekly, you're increasing the demands. Two to three days a week, right? At least, love even three to four. And I encourage people do three months of a specific strength building program, achieve the goals, and then vary it. I still want those muscles worked, but now instead of, let's say, doing a leg press seated machine, perhaps you're going to do it now standing with a band around your knees and light weights in your hands to begin with. And you're going to build up slowly there, increasing the weights progressively. But you cannot think that you're going to take three pound or five pound weights in your hands, do some little curls and do a few little squats and that you're building your bones. You're not. That's very important to be aware of. In addition, that's not even functional. Think about it. A gallon of water is eight pounds. So if you've got three pound or five pound weights in one hand, and then you're going to go pick up a gallon bottle of water, it doesn't work like that. This is the same as in the days you took tests and such in school. Don't study here and then the test is here, right? You're not going to be prepared for the test. You've got to study here and the test is here. Same thing with your strength. You need to be building strength so that now, okay, you want to pick up the, you know, 20 pound little, you know, side table, the 30 pound little side table. You want to pick up, right, the uh, 45 pound bag of organic oats that you bought wholesale at some place. Uh, you're not going to suddenly get a compression fraction in your back. Why? Because you have been lifting 45 and 50 pounds for weeks, months, years, right? So again, we start low, we build up progressively, but never stop. Because if you get that fracture risk, right? Here's what I was saying. Five to eight times increased risk of mortality, right? Oh, during the next several months um, after you, if for example, if you get that hip fracture. Um, but uh, 
what are the risks, right? We're, we talked about some of those there. I want to talk briefly too. You can see some of the things here with regards to balance and reaction time. These are very important because how thick your bones are is not the only predictor of fractures. And so we and the medical societies on average are myopic. We focus just on that. What's your DEXA? What's your FRAX score, which is a written sort of uh, evaluation of kind of risk of fracture. Uh, and then we go, okay, here's your risk. And because you're osteoporotic, you got to get on this medication and we move on. The reality is there are many people out there who have less than ideal bone density, but will never fracture in their life because they've maintained excellent range of motion of their joints and their structures, excellent reaction time, right? And they've maintained good cognition and awareness. So balance is crucial for you to be working on as well as you age. Three different areas of this. There's vision. So, right? So where are the contacts? Where are the glasses? Do whatever you need to do. Get the Lasix, get the cataracts out, whatever you need to do to have good vision, address it. You want to have the best vision possible. Number two, proprioception. That term means an awareness of position in space. Proprioception is related to a combination of vision, neurologic function, and cerebellar health. The cerebellum is the portion of the brain in the back of the brain related to balance and coordination. Now, if you've got type 2 diabetes, you need to be reversing it. You need to do my four-week, six-week program, follow Chef AJ's recommendations, ideally get off medications and help feed your nerves so that you don't have those neuropathies, right? Because diabetes is the leading cause of neuropathies in the legs uh, in America. And that loss of sensation in the feet increases your risk of falling, tripping, stumbling, et cetera. But we need to work also on proprioception. Remember how I said that with senile, with senescence, with aging, we lose our neurologic abilities. Our nerves are slowed down a bit, et cetera. Well, how do you maintain that? By stimulating the nervous system in ways that challenge it. Walking is not enough. I need you doing little ski hops side to side. If you watch some of my Instagram or Facebook posts, I'm putting up more and more of those little sort of things, little exercise, little activities, it's just at Esser Health. Other things to be working on with that proprioception, including single leg balance, tossing a ball against a wall while you're standing on one leg, ballroom dancing, Tai Chi, yoga type activities. These are all valuable. Standing on one leg and throwing a ball back and forth with a loved one, playing tennis, pickleball, activities that require you to change direction quickly. This is very important because on average, the people who fall and break their hips or their femur, what is happening? Well, usually it's there's an unstable surface. They turn quickly. They lost their quote balance and that's why they fell. Rarely is it a, you know, some random person pushed them down during a mugging or something, right? I mean, but on average, it's some random thing that led to their fall. So we want to reduce that risk as much as possible. There's a great little test. You can look it up online. It's the get up and go test. I'd encourage all your viewers to try it themselves. It's called the get up and go test. Uh, and then there's another version of that where you get up, walk 10 steps, turn around, walk back, sit down. And they have full cutoffs for how quickly you should be able to do that. And if you are above the cutoff, meaning it takes you a lot longer, your risk of falls and fractures radically goes up. It's a simple little test that just tells you, right? Because if you're turning slowly, oh, turning really slowly here, no way. I mean, if you if you get on a little slippery surface or something or somebody yells at you and you turn quickly, you're done for because you're gonna topple and that's where you get the fracture. So we need to be working on our response time intentionally. We need to be working on that balance work and we need to check the boxes, vision, proprioception, right? And cognition, ideally, you want to maintain, obviously, for lots of reasons. Now, a couple of things about nutrition and our bone health. We'll start with the acid-base theory. This is the idea that high consumption of uh, proteins, in particular animal-based proteins, alters the chemical environment of our body in such a way that it's more acidic. And as the body tries to uh, achieve homeostasis and balance out that acidic environment, it sort of leaches out or robs uh, some of the salts from the bones, uh, and, uh, you know, the studies with regards to this, uh, with regards to, you know, uh, calcium excretion related to this are a little up in the air, a little uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, but there certainly are studies uh, that show us um, that as we consume more high quantities of proteins, uh, that we can alter osteoclast activity. And so the osteoclasts become more active. And as the osteoclasts become more active, what do we say they do? They cut or break down the bone and decrease its density. 
So for that reason, extremely high protein rich diets are, are negative for the bones. Uh, but in like fashion, like we might expect, extremely low, low protein diets, too far low, can also be less than ideal for the bones. Uh, milk theory, a lot of people out there love to write, say, got milk, right? This is the magical nutrient. And I think as most of your viewers know, clearly that's not the case. We'll look at one or two studies. But I always like to just start the simple basic question, which is, you know, do you know any other animal that voluntarily drinks the milk of another animal in nature? And the answer, of course, is no. There are no raccoons sneaking up to gazelle's tits at night and drinking milk off of them. Uh, it just doesn't happen. And so something that simple, like just saying, hey, no other creature does this, clearly uh, probably not the most ideal for us. And, and when we look at big studies that followed people over extended periods of time, uh, increased milk consumption, not only did it not help with fracture protection, um, but in fact, it doubled the risk of death and had a 44% increase in the risk of cancer. So uh, even people going up to three glasses a day of, of cow pus or milk, right? I mean, so it's just really, we're not intended for it. The milk theory falls apart when you actually look at the data. So obviously stop drinking milk. It's not good for your bones. And another study here by the good Dr. McDougall, who I know Chef AJ and I both love and respect. Um, and you, you know, nice slide he'd put together here some years back, showing even kind of with regards to calcium intake and the relationship to fracture risk that by itself, calcium intake does not uh, equate with uh, a reduction in fracture risk. But nutrition does play an important role when it comes to your bones. And there are a lot of different ones, right? We've got that vitamin D that helps with calcium absorption. We've got the vitamin K, we've got the calcium, we've got the magnesium, the boron, the vitamin C, the sodium, uh, so on and so forth. Now, I put on here the sodium because you may not be aware of this, but it turns out sodium is a cation. That means it has a positive charge. And calcium is a cation. And you guessed it, the body's trying to maintain a certain balance of cations and anions, right? Anions are the negatively charged molecules in your body. And when you consume large quantities of a cation like sodium, the body says, this is too much. I, I need to try to get rid of some of these cations. And it will begin to actually increase your urinary excretion of calcium. You begin to pee out more of your calcium to try to compensate for the large quantities of sodium that you're consuming. So, you know, when the average American is consuming, you know, far more than the upper tolerable limit of salt, right? More than four grams per day, uh, that becomes problematic. And so we want you to drop that salt consumption because A, it's bad for the bones and B, of course, it causes that fluid retention. It's an appetite stimulant and damages blood vessels. So lots of other reasons, but for your bone health, uh, let's say you're eating a plant-based program, but eating large quantities of salt, you're not helping your bones. So be conscientious of that. I also put up here, when we talk about calcium, many people go, oh yeah, I take my calcium. I want to remind you that more recent studies published last year and the year before demonstrated that if you're taking oral calcium carbonate or calcium supplements by themselves, you increase your risk of a coronary artery event of a heart attack in women by up to 15%. And so that's problematic. We, the number one cause of death, right? Every 34 seconds, someone dies of a heart attack in America. So we always want to measure our decisions based on risk reward. And taking oral calcium is not the answer. Eating calcium rich foods can be beneficial, but not taking the oral calcium itself just by itself. Now you've heard, and we'll talk about some of the studies that plant-based diets may be linked to lower bone density and higher fracture risk. Well, why would that be? Well, let's go back to the medical school stuff we spoke of. On average in plant-based diets, people who consume a plant-based program, on average consume fewer total calories. As a result, they often have lower BMIs. In addition, many have lower calcium intake, lower vitamin D status, and of course, lower protein intake. And in addition, lower phosphorus intake. All of these can be negatively related to bone health. Now, when we look at this study from 2015, which I found interesting. They compared bone density in individuals adhering to different dietary choices, and they follow them over time. And what was interesting is their conclusion. This is a conclusion you can see right there. These data suggest that plant-based diets are not detrimental to bone in young adults, because what they found was that in lacto-ovo vegan and omnivore diets, uh, starting at the beginning and then following out for a full year, a low a dietary recall and the repeat DEXA scans and all this, that eating a fully vegan diet had no negative effects on bone health. 
Now, the problem, of course, is that this is in young individuals and also in non-obese individuals. And so would we expect a big decline? Yeah, not if they're in that bone forming phase and not if they're in the consolidation phase. Now, we need a study in which they take women who are at the high risk of osteoporosis and look at them at the perimenopausal to five years after menopause, right? And then have them all on different diets and see what happens to their bone density and see if, in fact, their bone density drops significantly on those on a plant-based program. Now, the big meta-analyses that have been more recently published right across the boards do suggest, right, that individuals who consume a vegan, a strict plant-based diet, had lower bone mineral density at the femoral neck, lumbar spine, and vegans also had higher fracture rates, right? So this is the meta-analysis looking at this. We talked about why that would be, lower bone mineral density, right, so on and so forth. Um, now, others, here's some other study, right, that showed similar things, right? Rates of fracture over 16 years as related to diet intake this is an epic Oxford study, uh, once again, showing increased risk of hip fractures in particular, in vegans, here's another one, risk factor, risk of a uh, hip fracture mediators, pastarians and vegetarians. Um, interesting here, no clear evidence of effect modification on by BMI, but they did again find that vegans had a higher risk of hip fracture, right? So now I, I wanna go back to this for a second because I think this is worth conversing about. Some of the limits of these studies are the following. Dietary recall is very challenging for anybody. What is a healthy plant-based program versus an unhealthy plant-based program? Why did the individual go on a vegan diet to begin with? Was it because they had inflammatory bowel disease and already had poor bone density? All of these factors are very important. And I think what we need even more studies of is to look at individuals who adopt a plant-based program, let's say for um, planetary reasons, animal husbandry reasons, or just general health and then track them over 10 years, 20 years, and look at their bone density changes. And that will give us more of a definitive opinion. However, as a physician, what I would say that the state of the science presently is, is that individuals consuming a strictly plant-based program appear to have higher rates of osteopenia, osteoporosis, and potentially higher rates of hip fractures. We need to take all that into account for those of us who advocate for and love eating a plant-based program. Now, it's funny because some people would say, aha, see, the increased risk of osteoporosis. Thus, it's not the right diet. Let's get back to eating the dead animal carcasses. But here's the problem with that mindset. With that mindset, you're completely ignoring the fact that a whole food plant-based program is the number one and only proven way to reverse and prevent the number one cause of death, which again is heart disease. And so we always have to remember when we're making any health decisions in our life, we should be comparing the risk benefit relationship of all of them. It's like the person who says, oh, I don't exercise because that you can get hurt. I've known people, they tore the rotator cuff, they blew their ACL, but if you don't do all that exercise, you know, that thing's not, that doesn't happen. Well, yes, but they're ignoring the fact that exercise also, right, has all these incredible health benefits like I shared last time in our talk. And so we need to always come to the data and come to the health decisions we make saying, Number, you know, will this decision decrease or increase my leading risk of death? No, it won't. Okay, check the box. Now, will it, and so on and so forth, down number one, number two, number three, number four. So you need to be that much more conscientious of your health decisions if, let's say, you have a personal or a strong family history of a specific health condition that you're trying to address. And you make decisions based on that. So let's walk through a little bit on this nutritional piece, right? Bone health is complex. Personal choices can be effective. Function and fractures can be altered. Life's not perfect. Let's go back to this. Here's what's in your control. Here's out of your control. Let's now walk through a few things. Number one, here's your plan. We're gonna start wrapping up with some of the plan stuff. Number one, toxins. Eliminate or minimize alcohol. Remove nicotine. Moderate your caffeine. Oh, I didn't get much into this, but this is important. Caffeine is a diuretic. As a result of being a diuretic, it increases urination, right? That's what it's doing and fluid excretion. And as it, excuse me, does so, it whips the kidneys in such a way that they also tend to excrete more calcium. So large quantities of caffeine consumption can be related to lower bone density because they cause you to pee off calcium and other cofactors. So a cup of dark coffee, a cup of green tea, fine. 
four, five, three, six, eight repetitive, you know, stops at the local Dunkin' Donuts or going to the, you know, gas station for big gulps of diet sodas, et cetera. No, no, no. But as far as soda and diet soda, I would completely eliminate that from your diet as well because the acidic nature of these, right? They can produce uh, acidic environment in the body that impairs bone health as well as other uh, organ systems. Uh, and then also, as we talked about, the caffeine negative effects. Next, medications, right? So write these out. These are your goals. Avoid, eliminate, minimize medication use when possible. If you notice that when you eat a bunch of Tabasco sauce and a bunch of random food, all of a sudden you're getting the GERD and this reflux and oh, your chest pain and all this, what are you doing? Don't take the Pepsid. Stop eating all the garbage, right? Chew your food well, eat slowly, eat small quantities, so on and so forth. But don't eat all the junk that then leads to the reflux and then requires you to take the medication that then impairs your calcium absorption and leads to poor bone density. Next, know your numbers. You need to know your BMI. You need to know your thyroid, your TSH, your T3, T4. You need to know your vitamin D levels, your calcium, your parathyroid hormone, your CBC. Uh, that's your complete um, blood count to make sure you know your uh, that you're not anemic, that can also impair right bone density and all your inflammatory markers, that there's not this underlying chronic inflammation that's impairing bone health. When you have all this data, now you're coming to the table of your health informed, and now you can make informed decisions, right? So that vitamin D status is low. Hey, do we need to get outside and get a little bit more exposure on the trunk, arms, and legs? Or do we need to replete that vitamin D status? Your calcium is low. What's going on? Is it that you're renally excreting too much? Is that you're whipping uh, your adrenals or other portions of the hormone balance system that you're now excreting calcium excessively? Uh, or is it that you're not consuming enough? What's happening here? Or is it that a hormonal issue with your thyroid or parathyroid is the issue? We need to know all these things. So don't uh, you know, kind of shirk your responsibility. Get all this data. Sit down with a well-trained health practitioner so you understand your risk factors. Next, comorbid conditions. We talked about all these, the inflammatory bowel diseases, right? The autoimmune conditions, you know, know what's going on in your body and address whatever these other diseases are appropriately so they're not impairing bone health. Exercise, a lot of areas. One, I want postural awareness from all of you. We talked about this. For those of you right this, here's my cell phone in my hand. This is unacceptable. I need you to be the weirdo who's up here. Right? If you're going to be on this cell phone up here and as brief as possible, look what it just did to my neck. So instead of my neck being here and my mid back rounded, which leads to that kyphotic posture, we call it, we want to be up here. So my phone up here, my computer screen needs to be equal to my ears. Right? I recently bought for my laptop one of those little folding stands, just go up on top of my desk. So my laptop is up equal to my ears. Why is this important? Because compression fractures where the bone goes in your mid back are extraordinarily common. And the more kyphotic, meaning the more forward curve that your mid back is, the more pressure on the bones. And so years of being bent forward, if you, for example, if you are someone who does tasks constantly forward, bent forward, you're an optometrist, you're an ophthalmologist, you're a dentist, you're a lawyer, you're somebody who's just on a computer all day, so on and so forth. If you're rounded here, if you're a mom with six kids, you've been breastfeeding all of them and you're rounded in the shoulders, right? All of it. You need to be doing the exercises I put on Instagram the other day. All the low rows, right? All the high rows, all the kickbacks every day, even twice a day to compensate for the effect of gravity and posture pulling you forward that then overloads your mid back and will increase your risk of a thoracic compression fracture. So ergonomics matter, your posture throughout the day. For example, I know Chef AJ spends a lot of time inspiring people on the internet, right? Doing so much good and on her computer, but she's got to, got to, got to make sure that she's got good ergonomic setup. And then she's got to get up every once in a while and do low rows to strengthen her upper mid back. So it's pulling her up and open rather than rounding her back, right? We all need to do that. I do it every day because I'm a tall, skinny guy and I don't want, right, that rounded posture that will increase my risk of compression deformities. Next, you've got to work your core. You've got to work your low back, especially in extension positions. So laying prone, face down on the ground, doing opposite arm, opposite legs, right? Just gently lifting up or pointer dogs, right? Where you're on your hands and knees, lifting one arm and the other leg, 
uh, opposite leg and then holding for five or 10 seconds. And the opposite, holding for five or 10 seconds. That's working on balance, core strength, coordination, all of these crucial things. So important. I'm a little right in here real quick too. Uh, oh, we'll talk about it in a minute. But then all the other areas, right? The impact, the balance, coordinate, all this good stuff. So, so valuable for you. So if you're not familiar with it, some good functional training where they have you start by a real light little tiny dumbbell, lifting it up, turning, rotating, lifting up overhead, all in one movement. This sort of functional training is so real for life. So when you go to lift that gallon bottle off the bottom or the huge pot full of those wonderful baked beans that you made from Chef AJ's recipe, that you don't suddenly go, you know, in your mid back, right? Very important stuff. When it comes to your nutrition, I want you to make sure you're eating a variety of colorful plant foods. I get in this bad habit too of sometimes being like, well, I have this for breakfast, this for lunch, this, because I'm happy. I'm a simple guy. So it's like, I can be like beans and rice and a salad and I'm done, right? I'm happy. It's fine. But we really need to make sure we're varying. So there's studies, for example, on anthocyanidin rich pigment foods, right? That these deep purples and blues actually activate your osteoblasts. Pretty cool. And they inhibit your osteoclasts. So making sure you're getting enough of those deep berries every day, right? And so I look at some foods almost as though they're medicinal in nature. So when I'm making a smoothie or making some unique dish as a side, I'm throwing some of that stuff in there, right? So it's like, if I'm going to make a smoothie, for example, you better believe I'm going to have that pineapple in there, a bunch of different greens, a bunch of turmeric to reduce inflammation. I'm going to pack it full as much as possible rather than just being like, well, I'm in the mood for a smoothie off a banana and so, you know, a few strawberries in there. No, not, that's not it. And so look to, to, to supplement your diet with these healthy things. The, the kiwi that I had this morning, the big cup of kale, although Chef AJ had four cups of kale this morning already, right? And then the, the fig, you know, orange. But look up. It's fun to kind of learn this and say, oh, a little calcium-rich food, a little magnesium-rich food. Let's add a few more of these here and there. In the midst of this plan, I want you to remember that phrase I said, avoid the twos. Don't go too far, too fast, too soon. But train for adversity. Oh, okay. What does that mean? That means don't just get comfortable doing the exact same exercise in a comfortable position seated on your bed all day. I need you to do stuff that puts you out of your comfort zone a little bit. Because when you step on that pine cone and trip a little bit to the side or catch your toe on the concrete that's raised a little, you need to be able to quickly catch yourself, right? With your foot, a little stutter step. And so I'd love you to try things that take you out of your comfort zone a little, right? So those line dances that you have zero interest in doing, right? Those are part of your osteoporosis prevention program or your fracture prevention program. But very important. Also, don't be a hero or an island, right? In other words, that person who says, well, I'm independent, I'm healthy, I'm 72, not a big deal. I'm going to lift the planner. It's like, yeah, no, not the right choice. If you have a dolly and you want to push the planter back a little, get the dolly under it, move it, great, good choice. Not a good choice to be like, eh, you know, kind of a thing. That's how you get a compression fracture, or herniated disc in your low back if you're not conditioned to do it. So instead, allow other people to build up some graces in their own life. Invite that 20-year-old grandson of yours to come over and make him a nice meal or whatever and have him move the planter, right? Or so on and so forth, right? Boxes of books, whatever it might be. You're, in the, you're moving, so on and so forth. But I can tell you, I have seen countless individuals, none of them even were plant-based, but who got compression fractures in their backs, just merely lifting some heavy object or heavy thing they were not accustomed to lifting. Not for you to do. You don't want that. Next is this. This is valuable. As soon as you get off of this, or you want to pause right now, modify your physical environment to minimize your fall risk, especially if you have an impaired gait, if you're a little stuttery with how you walk, if your vision's not perfect. Go through your home identify things on the floor like rugs, little raised edges, electrical cords that you run across from here to here to run your lamp, things like that. No, 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 unacceptable. Because in the dusk, in the wee hours, when you're not focused, whatever it might be, that's a fall risk right there. And so you want to actually walk through your home as though you're an inspector and look for all little areas that could lead for a fall. And what are easily modifications? change where things are plugged in, tape things down, change out your rugs, get something that actually sits down solid or get rid of the rug. Take little, get those little plug-in motion activated lights, right? They don't even, they're LED. They don't even run unless it's dark and they only come on when you walk by. Crew, these are great things. These are great things. 
but these are preventives to reduce the likelihood of you falling. And if you do have thinner bones, then getting the fracture, right? Because again, the two have to occur together, the fall and then the, the poor bone density and then the fall. So there were the meds listed, so I know we're running out of time. So your bones are powerful, but not perfect. Bone health is a blend of nature and nurture. What you do has powerful effects. No single nutritional intervention prevents everything. My statement that eating a plant-based diet may increase your risk of less than ideal bone density does not mean that plant-based diet is not the way to go. It just means, right, that you've got to focus in on how's your caloric intake? Is it adequate? How's your BMI? And never forget, right, and then all the micronutrients are adequate and all the rest. Never forget that nutrition is only one part of health, right? It's not the only thing. And so that movement, that exercise, that bone building stuff, right? The, all the other factors, the sleep and the emotional hygiene and all that, so crucial. Do not just hang around and wait to be diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis though. Develop that plan of action today. And with that, I'll close Chef AJ and uh, take any questions that we have. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Esser. Um, you know, I lost the Zoom for a while, so I'm so happy that you were able to keep going and there was no <laughs> service. I was able to watch it on my phone, but I did lose the chat. However, if you want to answer a few questions, we always give priority to the people that sent them in in advance. So uh, would you like to answer a few? or do you I have would a love to. Let's do it. I, I know last time you had a, I didn't realize you taught tennis. I do. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun these days. I am your host, gonna... Chef AJ. Yeah. Oh, this is where I introduce you. Sorry about that. So, so yes, I, I've got a couple of minutes. Let's do it. How does one get a tennis lesson with you? Oh, you, you have to be very special. Very special. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll just add, and we'll do as many as we can. The first one is from Susan. I fell on my back. I, I fell on black ice a little over a week ago. It hurts so much. I went to have an x-ray and thank goodness nothing is broken. They said I had a sacroiliac pain. I was given some stretching exercises and told to just take ibuprofen, but it still hurts. And I am an avid runner. What else can I do to get back to baseline as soon as possible? Yeah. If it's not improving, you need an MRI of your sacrum and coccyx to truly rule out a stress injury. So x-rays cannot rule out a sacral stress fracture. And I've had countless people, women in particular, over the age of 45, who've fallen straight down on their butts and then came in six weeks later saying, I'm still hurting. And everybody's told me it's just, I don't have any fracture. I get the MRI and it shows they've got a sacral stress fracture. And that can take, unfortunately, up to 11 months to fully heal. Um, so, but you should want the data. So I would just get a quick MRI of your sacrum and coccyx. No, there is or is not a straight sacral stress fracture and then move on. Because if there is a sacral stress fracture, the only treatment is rest, protection, and time, and excellent nutrition, um, versus if it's no fracture, then all of the uh, chiropractic SI adjustments, you know, physical therapy mobilization, all of that good stuff can be very helpful. Thank you. And also, you wouldn't want to be taking an anti-inflammatory if you have a sacral stress fracture, because that slows bone healing. So you, can, you should be able to get an MRI of your sacrum uh, if you're still having a lot of pain in that tailbone sacrum area, either from your physician or you can actually even get a cash pay MRI, usually for around $250 to $500. Oh, that, it, it, you, that, that's not terrible. No, no. I, I, so I have patients all through here, all through Florida that will call me and just say, can you send me uh, an MRI script? And I find them a cash pay place and they get it cash pay. They don't need a doctor. You know, they just need a referral from a doctor, but they don't need to actually have a reason for it. Right. So uh, my place is here in Jacksonville. It's 250 for a high quality MRI of any body part. So anybody wants an MRI of their shoulder, hip, knee, back stuff. I just go, yeah, here, here's a script. Go get it. Wow. Nice. That's very kind yeah. of you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Celeste has had an MRI and she said that she has multiple schmoral, S-C-H-M-O-R-L. Uh huh. You know what that is? I don't. Nodes in the thoracic spine with peripheral enhancement, mild enhancement in the bilateral paraspinal muscles at the level of L1 and 2, mild to moderate enhancement around the spinous process of L5. But she wants to know, is it safe for her to do jumping exercises to build bone density with what we told you she has? Yeah. So that mild enhancement all sounds interesting. If that's an MRI of your back, enhancement normally suggests inflammation in the area. So I'd want to understand that better. What's the cause of that inflammation? Where is it coming from? So a couple other tests would be valuable. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, you'd want to, as far as health for, uh, safety for your bones, well, I mean, a DEXA scan or some bone density testing is far more uh, valuable to understand 
uh, things. But enhancement on an MRI usually means inflammation. So you'd want more data. Great. This is an interesting question. It's like a general question. So I love it from a different Susan. She said, could Dr. Esser please explain the difference between bone density and bone strength and how is bone strength actually measured? Yeah, there's not a good test that I know of true bone strength, right? Because bone strength would essentially be take a bone out of somebody and try to break it. Um, bone density is a marker of bone integrity. Um, so they're not really the exact same thing, uh, but you know, bone density is just saying how dense, how thick on the inside that bone is, right? How many of those little fibers, like we talked about, that sponge are still interconnected. Uh, and that is a predictor of bone strength, of bone health long-term. Uh, but yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, you, you've gone an hour, so I want to respect your time, just so you know. Yeah, you can keep whatever you want. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know, you know, I'd love for you to show your donkey sometime. <laughs> we'll have to run it from over there next to him. Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm doing the ones that are more like, you know, in your area of specialties, yeah, although well, I know that you can um, probably answer anything, but like, I mean, parasites yeah, well, is, yeah, is not really, I mean, no. cause you are, you are a regular doctor too, but you, you do specialize in that. Ah, uh, uh, here's one. <laughs> well, cause I mean, people are asking about parasite cleanses and stuff and I can ask those if you want, but I, since this is about bone health, I'm trying to get questions that are more about the bones. This is uh, uh, from Christina. I like it. She, she says, what can be done about a diagnosis of severe osteoporosis for someone in their 40s? The only recommendation so far has been injections that cause bone growth, but they have horrible potential side effects, cancer being one of them. I've also heard that bone growth is not real solid bone. This person has a lumbar spine fracture that can't be repaired due to her osteoporosis, and she's worried about lifting weights or wearing a weighted vest. Absolutely. Great question. And I think the first thing would be you need way more data. Hopefully she's had a complete metabolic workup, endocrine workup, checking all of her hormones, checking all of those different areas, uh, because that needs to be addressed first. What's going on? Somebody in their 40s should not be having severe bone loss uh, and osteoporotic fractures. So that's very abnormal. And I have time for one more question. And once that all that data is there, then she can make an informed decision about next steps, because it may be that her hormones need to be addressed in order to heal all the bones, et cetera. So one more question. Okay. Oh, I hope it's a good one. I don't know. So do I. Uh, okay. It's again osteoporosis, but it's a little bit different scenario. Uh, this is from Andrea. What weight-bearing exercises do you suggest for someone in their mid-50s who has mild osteoporosis, but also has a herniated disc and mild spinal stenosis as a result? I cannot jog or lift weights. Does yoga, walking, or rebounding help improve bone density? Um, does, does, oh. Um, so none, yoga, walking, and no, it does not. And so what I'd start with is seeing a good physical therapist and developing a program based upon uh, the level of herniation in the back um, and start there. So I'd, I'd start with a good bone building, core building, strength program there, and then build progressively from that point moving up. Great. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Dr. Esther. You know what you're going to be covering next month or will it be a surprise? Uh, what I'd love to do if you're open to it is kind of musculoskeletal health and nutrition. Um, so we love nutrition and we love musculoskeletal health. Hey, so was I, was I, when you saw me do my, uh, spinning on the, on Instagram, was that, was that like enough exercise? Like, cause I was huffing and puffing, but I still could talk, but I could not sing. I liked it. I liked it. Keep it up. The thing is I can't really sing even when I'm off the bike, just so you know. So <laughs> at least not very well. Thanks so much, Dr. Esther. Really my pleasure. It. It's Bye. Bye. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please do understand when we have doctors as guests, we do have to have the questions submitted in advance. It's a very simple process. Just sign up to get my newsletter at chefaj.com once a week, usually on Saturday, but occasionally on Sunday, we send you the lineup for the week and you simply respond with who the question is for. And please come back at 2 p.m. today. That's Pacific time for my 1400th episode with special guest, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, where we're going to tackle the truth.